Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Renu Tyagi from Department of Anthropology, University of Delhi. Today I am going to speak on the module Cultural Ecology, its concept, definition and relevance. After completing this module, we will be able to understand the concept of Cultural Ecology. This module will enable the students to gain insight into the process of adaptation. Number 3, this module will equip the students to study the relevance of cultural ecology. Now, let us have a look at the introduction. Cultural ecology is an important branch in ecological anthropology. Ecological anthropology is broadly defined as the study of relations between human being and their environment. Orloff defines ecological anthropology as the study of relationship among the population dynamics social organization and culture of human population and the environment in which they live. Within this framework, cultural ecology studies the relationship among the transformation of nature, social reproduction and cultural processes within particular social formations. To understand cultural ecology, it is necessary to know the relationship between ecology and culture. The term ecology was coined by the biologist Ernest Haeckel in 1869. Nowadays, it has come to mean the study of all aspects of the interaction between organism and their environments. The latter include the physical that is abiotic environment and other species that is the biotic environment. In the broadest sense, ecology includes the interactions with the environment involving all biological processes including physiology, development, demographic, social interaction and evolution. It includes the interaction at all level including individual, population of a single species, pair of interacting species and communities ecosystem of multiple species. Cultural ecology has been traced to emerge from North American anthropology in the mid 20th century. Cultural ecology has mostly concerned itself with the non-industrial societies, typically pastorist, hunter-gatherers, fishing culture and small-scale cultivators with an emphasis on ethnographic field methods. Cultural ecology in this sense is most closely associated with the work of Julian Stewart and Chicago School of Thought, particularly after the publication of Stewart's Theory of Cultural Change. Most of the ethnographers follows this tradition that emphasizes a close relationship between symbolic culture that is values, religious beliefs and tradition on the one hand and the material ecological basis of a society on the other. Julian Stewart has emphasized the dynamic two-way nature of the culture environment relationship and the importance of the concept of adaptation in understanding it. Further, Stewart distinguished cultural from biological ecology on the ground that the former was about the adaptation of culture as a system existing outside of individual human organism. By contrast, in the so called new ecology of 1960s, culture was seen as the mean of environmental adaptation of human population. Theories developed in animal ecology were also considered applicable to human as well. Drawing on one such theory of the group selection, ecological anthropologists focused on how aspects of cultural behavior maintain balance or homeostasis in the relation between a local group and its environmental resources and so promotes its long term survival. Stewart in particular developed the notion of a cultural core shaped in a possibilistic perspective wherein critical environmental resources like crop animal, energy sources etc. were supposedly used by a culture. Netting observed that cultural ecology is a convenient conventional title rather than an invitation to scholarly debate. He further clarified that in contrast to other subfields within anthropology which took shape during the same period, 
For example, linguistics, cultural ecology did not emerge with a formally stated set of principles, theory or methodology. Rather, during the 1950s, a persistent dissatisfaction with existing theories of cultural change, which were either too vague to be tested or too rigid to account for the variation, stimulated a tendency to adopt an ecological perspective. This ecological tendency was to more closely consider the role played by the physical environment in cultural change. In opposing the prevailing explanation provided by the cultural determinism, where culture determines culture. In the late 1960s, the first generation of anthropologists influenced by Steward with the first three major empirical work in cultural ecology emerging within a span of two years. Netting's own The Hill Farmer of Nigeria in 1968, Roy Rappert's Pig for the Ancestors in 1968 and John Bennett's Northern Plainsmen in 1969. These early seminal works generally set the boundaries for cultural ecology as it has matured over the last three decades. It is Julian Stewart's primary interest on cultural formation and change, but cultural ecology more generally was at the forefront of scholarly attention to the questions about the social basis of environmental change. How culture respond or adapt to the environmental change and how culture influence the management of critical environmental resources. Moreover, considerable theoretical and methodological diversity characterizes self-described cultural ecologist. Critically, it is culture functionally linked to the environmental conditions and resource availability. This is apparent, for example, in Roy Rappert's work on wild pigs and the spiritual beliefs and rituals surrounding these resources in New Guinea. Figure 1 illustrates the cultural ecology from the figure, it can be said that cultural ecology deals with the interaction between place and the people. Now, we will study in brief the concept and relevance of cultural ecology. Process of adaptation and adaptive strategies used in cultural ecology. Cultural ecology includes description of different modes of subsistence. Environmental and ecological archaeology is the study of the relations between past human population and their environment and includes geoarchaeology, archaeobotany and zooarchaeology. Some issues discussed are discrete versus continuous mode of subsistence, the evolutionary linkages among them, the role of ecology and history in cultural evolution, the mechanism of cultural adaptation, the evolutionary ecology of culture, co-evolution and the future of our relationship with the environment. The material remains that archaeologists normally study the remnants of artifact such as tools, pottery, building and settlement of past human societies is logically part of culture more broadly. First, culture also include language as well as socially learned customs, beliefs and values. These merged into social roles, statuses or identities and these aggregated in turn into organization and institution. Hence, material culture used to be placed in the context of culture more generally. Second, since human including cultural ecology is logically part of ecology more broadly, it needs to be placed in that context. Although the actual historical story of the evolution of these fields of study is considerably more complex than these simple logical distinction, they are used here as the organizing principle and hence the discussion will proceed from ecology to human, specifically cultural ecology and then to environmental and ecological archaeology including a discussion of the impact of people on their environments. And thence to environmental and ecological archaeology, including a discussion of the impact of people on their environments.
in particular cultural ecologists commonly distinguish among societies with different subsistence patterns that is way of making a living from nature distinguishing in particular among hunting and gathering horticultural pastoral and intensive agricultural societies the concept of adaptation is ubiquitous in cultural ecology and ecological and environmental archaeology different modes of subsistence are different modes of adaptation to the ecological environment now let's see the concept of adaptation and adaptive strategies used in cultural ecology steward in 1955 posed the question on how much of culture is adaptation to environment versus other factor and the origin of cultural feature which can be traced to relationship with environment for him cultural ecology is equal to the effect of environment upon culture special type of ecology characterizing men as cultural bearer gears in 1963 has used the concept of involution or over adaptation where of an established form for example wet rice agriculture under increasing population density in such a way that it becomes rigid through an inward directed over elaboration eric wolf in 1966 gave the concept of ecotype the ecological adaptation of the peasantry consists of a set of food transfers and a set of devices used to harness the inorganic sources of energy to productive processes together these sets make up a system of energy transfers from environment to men such a system of energy transfer are called as an ecotype cohen adaptation as organizing principle can be understood human societies alter their relationship to a habitat in order to make that habitat a more fit place to live rapport gave the consist of homeostasis according to him adaptation is multidimensional man adapt to the two environment that is cognitive and operative culture impose on nature as nature impose on culture how man particulates in an ecosystem depend not only on the structure and the composition of that ecosystem but also upon the cultural baggage of those who enter it what they and their descendants subsequently receive by diffusion or invent themselves the demands imposed on the local population from outside and the need which may be fulfilled by the local population from outside vaida and mckay gave the consist of existential game societies respond to the environmental hazards bennett defined adaptation as a social process and strategic behavior he further stated it as a rational or purposive manipulation of social and natural environments multidimensional in terms of impact good for one group and not good for the other or for nature in this scenario the structure is loose and not fixed now let's understand the lofton pattern of resource exploitation within a given macroeconomic framework the peasant economy is seen as more than a specific form of adaptation to the physical environment the model also consider form of supra regional division of labor as reflected in local economies the diversity of possible mode of adaptation is a response to a specific environment according to ellen human adaptation involves the modification of behavior in order to adjust to new conditions cope with the hazards or improve existing conditions it may be an active conscious process or unconscious by product of another activity individuals are the main agents of adaptation and they adapt mainly through the change in their social and economic relationships according to wilk households can act as an adaptive groups the structure of patterned human action the household is the logical level of analysis in cultural ecology 
he concluded that societies adapt in only the most abstract sense of the world, but households adapt in concrete and observable ways. Adaptation is an active and dialectical process, whereas people change their environment even as they change themselves and their social arrangements. Existing forms or tradition provides template for acceptable change and involve interaction between social forms and productive techniques. Adaptation also can be understood with reference to the different societies as hunting and gathering societies, horticultural societies, pastoralist, intensive agricultural societies. Adaptation process among hunting and gathering societies can be understood in a simple way. In hunting and gathering societies, people eat wide varieties of food available in their environment. They do little to actively control the reproduction of exploited species. They do utilize a great array of plant and animal species of which they possess detailed knowledge but commonly concentrate on the tubers, seeds, nuts and fruits of plant as well as small animals and birds. A few have specialized in hunting large animals. Hunter gatherers may be sedentary if a rich store of resource is available. Locally as was the case with salmon for the Nu Cha Nult of the British Columbia coast and with sea mammal for the Chumush of the California coast. In these communities, population sizes can become large and social organization complex. In most cases, however, hunter gatherers live in small bands of an average of 25 or so and rarely more than 40 people. They are mobile in some or all of the three ways as followed. First, they may travel frequently foraging through a familiar landscape on a route timed to when resources are expected to become available. Second, they may instant or in addition make trips often in smaller groups out from a short or longer term home base, collecting resources which are brought back to the home base. Finally, they may migrate into a wholly new area. This displayed figure exemplify the mobility of hunting and the gathering societies. It was reported that once all human societies were hunter gatherers and it was the means of this mode of subsistence that they spread out to populate the earth. As all parts of the world became inhabited, however, and some groups turned to agriculture to make a living hunter-gatherers came to be limited to more marginal habitats. Relationship between hunter-gatherers and farmers tend to be uneasy for obvious reasons, but in some cases mutualistic relationships have been established with trade between them based on exchange of the wild for cultivated foods. Despite the limitation that most people having turned to agriculture as placed on the hunter-gatherers, many anthropological studies have shown that this may be of the, I repeat, have shown that this way of life remains successful for some even providing greater leisure, for example, than others mode of subsistence. Some hunter-gatherers that have been studied by anthropologists are Australian aborigines, the Inuit of Canadian Arctic the sand of the Kalahari Desert in southern Africa and the buttocks of the Philippines. Figure 2 shows the hunting and gathering societies. Now let us see adaptation processes among horticultural societies. Horticultural societies practice small scale agriculture with human labor using hand tools and without draft animals. Although they may keep small domesticated animals such as chickens and pigs, the extent to which horticulturists alter the landscape and control the reproduction of domesticated species in order to make a living from nature can vary greatly. The slash and burn or shifting cultivation is sometimes practiced in tropical forest 
where fields are cleared, planted and abandoned after a few years. When the soil become exhausted, Sweden agriculture is a more sustainable system in which fields are reused regularly after a fallow period. Because the diversity of biological species increases towards the equator and decreases towards the pole, tropical horticulture can be a very complex phenomena with many different species whose requirements complement each other interplanted which mature at different times and are used for different purposes. Elsewhere, the intensity of the cultivation can vary greatly between and within the societies. Small intensively cultivated gardens, sometimes terraced, may be maintained near home while plots for different species which are less intensively cultivated are located further afield. The degree of control over the reproduction of domesticated species can also vary from simply controlling what species grows whereby practicing some selective breeding choosing the best individual in a domesticated species for material to plant and breed. The less intensive the cultivation, the more likely it is that right to cultivate plots can be redistributed among families by the clan elders as family sizes vex and vain, but the more intensive the cultivation. The more these rights tend to be treated as family property. Some examples of the horticultural societies which have been studied by anthropologists are the Dani of Highland, New Guinea, the Noor and the Dinka of East Africa, the Kofiar of the Jos Plateau of Northern Nigeria and the Yanomam of Northwestern Brazil. Figure 3 displays the horticultural society. Now let us see the adaptation process among pastoralists. Pastoralists derive all or majority of their food and other resources from domesticated animals which they herd, goats, sheep, llamas, camels, cattle, etc. or less commonly simply follow. For example, reindeer. Pastoralism is really a form of gathering though not gathering directly. Pastoralists herd herbivores that gather that is which graze on grasses or browse on bushes that humans cannot digest and then the people live on the animal, on their milk, blood, meat, wool, hides, dung which are useful for fuel. The animals may provide the transportation as well. Like hunter gatherers, all pastoralists are mobile to varying degree. They may be almost continuously nomadic, herding their animals on a route timed to when resources are expected to be available. For example, among waterholes between lowland and the upland pastures, etc. Alternatively, or in addition, they may make trip often in smaller groups usually composed of younger males but which can extend to all males out from and back to a shorter or a longer term home based. This figure demonstrates the characteristics of a pastoral societies, but they often practice quite sophisticated selective breeding of their animals. Pastoralists live at higher population densities than hunter gatherers, but lower than the horticulturist because they often have animals available for transporting goods, they usually have more material possession than hunter gatherers. Some examples of pastoral societies which have been studied by anthropologists are the Sami of northern Scandinavia, the Noir of Maasai of East Africa and the Navazo of American Southwest. Figure 4 shows the Maasai, the pastoral society. Now let us see adaptation process among intensive agricultural societies. Intensive agriculturalist farm with intensive energy inputs derived from the animals by utilizing yoke and plough. 
they alter the landscape much more than the horticulturists do by applying larger fields and employing a great variety of method of intensification acquiring more resources per unit land area by irrigating controlling the floods diverting the streams building dams and canals digging wells and terracing as well as fertilizing rotating crops and selectively breeding crops and livestock agricultural production typically is concentrated on a single crop their population size birth rates and population densities are all higher than those of horticultural societies intensive agriculturists are sedentary their farming yield a surplus beyond that is needed to feed those who actually do the work of farming and caring for animals this permits emergency of some craft specialization and in the case of the most productive a whole strata or series of strata of craft specialist and religious political military and bureaucratic leaders in archaic states despite its productivity the narrowing of the diet which tend to occur under intensive agriculture and the social inequality which increases may result in deficiency diseases and poorer health at least for some those who do the actual agriculture work may live or live part of the time near their fields however all intensive agricultural societies include villages or towns with ceremonial centers and in the case of states a series of such which forms satellite around an even larger urban center some example of the intensive agriculturist that have been studied by the anthropologist are the tamang of nepal the mexican village of the kakur and the kofiar of central nigeria and other societies let's see the process of cultural adaptation adaptation strategies used in cultural ecology can be seen from figure 6 the evolutionary ecology of culture can be understood with the concept that it is widely accepted notion of foraging that low densities relative to resources favor eating acquiring more resources while high densities favor digesting that is deriving more breakdown products from each such resource unit acquired culture also behave in a similar way even hunter gatherers process food in various ways use tools to cut off the most tender cut the meats chop pound and winnow plant foods and cook many different kind of foods these are all methods of pre digestion suggesting that even hunter gatherers experience resource pressure indeed all techniques of cultivation used in horticulture and intensive agriculture techniques such as irrigation and fertilizing are the method of intensification of deriving more resources from each land unit on a larger scale low densities favor growth while high densities favor motility in a colonizable environment maintenance in a renewable one and mutability that is innovation in one with the environmental caring capacity unutilized for historical reasons while all culture use all of these strategies to some degree hunter gatherers tend to emphasize motility moving on when resources become depleted agricultural societies tend to emphasize maintenance methods of storing and preserving food until at least the next harvest industrial societies tend to be very technologically innovative density dependence is only one kind of example there are other evolutionary ecological principles of potential relevance to cultural ecology and archaeology principles such as scale frequency and heterogeneity dependent selections can be understood the concept of cultural ecology can be summarized and concluded as now we have understood the concept of cultural ecology which was first used by the anthropologist julian steward and leslie white in 1950s 
Stewart defined cultural ecology as the adaptive process by which the nature of society and an unpredictable number of features of culture are affected by the basic adjustment through which men utilizes a given environment. It has come to mean the study of all aspects of interaction between human culture and their ecological environments. Like other sciences, much of the cultural ecology is classificatory and descriptive. Cultural ecology was heavily influenced by the rise of ecology. This is true not only in terms of a focus on the relationship between environmental conditions and cultural processes, but also in some of the conceptual emphasis on system adaptation. Homeostasis, resilience, stability and so on which are all hallmark of an earlier phase of ecology. Cultural ecology has provided the various processes of adaptation by different forms of societies like the hunting, gathering, horticulturist, pastoralist and intensive agricultural practices. Notwithstanding the deeper understanding, the relationship between environment until culture, cultural ecology provided little capacity for understanding power, the appropriation of surplus and valuation in the context of a global political economy. Even when important linkages along these lines were recognized by cultural ecologists themselves. There is also another strand of argument about the relevance of political economy and the need for attention to the articulation of local social formation with broader social processes. At the same time, strict adherence to traditional ethnography in cultural ecology at times meant that particular social formations were conceptualized rigidly as such. Independent and isolated from the rest of the world with little or no consideration of or facility for the ways in which these ostensibly remote culture articulate with the social processes of broader scale of analysis. Thank you.